Hello to all. Happy Sunday. Happy Trans Awareness Week. We're right in the midst of it right now, and that makes Dwellin' It a fantastic uh, piece to include for Trans Awareness Week. As as I mentioned in the previous uh, in the previous episode, how it is an excellent way to help share awareness of lived experience of a trans individual by answering questions that others may have um, to just get, you know, my worldview or, you know, what the, what the day to day is like. And, and honestly, the best part is too, it's not like it can be of anything, right? It could be, you know, sex and gender, as I mentioned, it could be even cats and dogs. It can go anywhere between, you know, where do trans athletes belong in sports and, you know, what's your favorite movie? So like I said, happy trans awareness week. Let's dive right into it and see what we can do for the next half hour here. Why does it seem there's so much hate and negative attention about transgender people lately? Let's, let's narrow it down to three elements. One, patriarchy. Patriarchy is uh, rather frustrating to overcome because the established system of the cisgender white men being the cultural ideology across the globe, right? And if it's not in, in, in that area, there certainly is this idea of, of, of dominating that overall. Or if you really kind of dig everything back and peel the onions all the way, there's a lot of conceited individuals who think that they're better than the rest and are implementing systems all around them to assert that. So that's one. The second is in an extension of that, but not exclusively to the fact of cis white, because there are, of course, many women who are um, against trans individuals as well. And that has to, a lot to do with politics, right, with positioning themselves on their ideologies so that that actually kind of relates back to what I was saying earlier, but in a slightly more fluid extension of it on the idea that trans individuals are trying to take over the world, therefore we must oppress them as much as possible so that poison could never go ahead and harm any of us. And using that as a political platform so that people can assert their own careers so that they can go ahead and get their own dollars and cents from their business partners, their political partners, so that they can go ahead and squeak the things that, that, that scare others by using all the fear mongering and the scare mongering with misinformation so that they can go ahead and keep theirs. And unfortunately, because of that, you've got individuals who are maliciously speaking these things that really have no need to be said, which in turn scare others because they seem to just be automatically relatable even though there was something that was never understood or even knew existed in the first place before. And then the media. The media is a business. As much as we like to think that the media is supposed to go ahead and share things, right? And even when it comes to journalism, you can write fairly, but don't cause harm. But if you're not making money, you're not doing your job. And what makes money is sensationalism. And if you're not speaking sensational, if you're not doing sensational things, if you're not doing something that generates revenue by selling papers, getting clicks on sites, which in turns gets advertising revenue, and so on and so on, you're not doing your job. And if you want to keep your job as a journalist, kick the dust up. That's why there's so much hate. Because of an embedded system, if you're if you're not cisgender and if you're not white and you're not male, you're a problem. And then the political side of, well, I need to make sure that we can influence laws to make sure that I can keep my job because I'm not unable to do anything else except scare others and keep my job. And then, as I mentioned, the media putting the front forward of Oh, let's 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 talk about everything for everybody that uh, and let's put it this way You've got little like baby journalists who think they're gonna do better But when you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and higher and higher and higher on the ladder and then realize that we don't want to write about that So we don't want to talk about this We don't want to talk about whatever because it's gonna upset people and it's the, the cost benefit of talking about things that are Controversial, but we can't defend right. We don't want to do that but if we go ahead and stir the pot and stoke the fire and get all the people who are just going to go ahead and agree with us anyway and we don't have to put the work in and, and, and care about the people that we're harming. Okay, fuck, let's do that instead. So that's why. Fundamentally, like something that is really important to remember is allies of trans individuals largely think that not being trans, and I, I, see, I speak this generally, I speak this generally, and I openly say it. Allies of trans people, largely as a whole, feel they're doing enough by not being transphobic. But that's hardly enough. The, the, the neutrality is, is, is not harmful, for sure. But it is not 
stopping the hate. You might put a little wall up of being like, okay, hate can't go here, but it doesn't stop the hate from going around or getting louder elsewhere. Not being transphobic is not enough to stop hate and stop negative attention. Use the platform that you have, use the privilege that you have to not just say this space is safe for trans individuals. That position needs to, needs to expand to, how do we grow this safe space? How do I use my tools, my abilities, my privilege, my platform to expand the safe space? How does my ability as somebody with a voice that gets heard get used to change laws, to change platforms, to influence decision makers, to demand legal systems and so on, to, to, to prevent hate, to prevent the extremism, to prevent the violence. Not being transphobic for all intents and purposes is being invisible because everybody has a right to a life of not suffering abuse. So not being abusive is conducive to a normal life, but that doesn't stop the abuse from existing. The abusive voices are exponentially louder than the inclusive voices but the inclusive voices feel they're doing enough by being inclusive. That's why it feels like why there's so much hate and negative attention, because the people who have the power to stop hate don't. So until those people who have the power to stop hate start stopping hate, that will continue to happen. That's why it seems why there's so much hate and negative attention, because overall, the world is much safer than unsafe for trans individuals. There's no question about that. But unfortunately, the consequence of hate is exponentially higher than it is for pretty much every other marginalized community. And then let's go into that even further and break it down between white transgender individuals and then BIPOC transgender individuals and then add the extra matrix of male and female and non-binary and you are going to blow your mind as to who suffers the most violence fundamentally on a day-to-day -day, it's just like saying that flying in a plane right is is safer than driving right statistically however when there's a plane crash and it takes out hundreds of people all at once that is an absolute catastrophe as opposed to the little one-off incidents of, of, of driving so the same thing happens when it comes to trans lives. Fundamentally, trans individuals can make it through a day harm-free. However, when harm happens, it is catastrophic. And for whatever reason, trans allies feel like so long as they don't do things that are harmful, that's good enough. And I've used this analogy in the past, and I will continue to use this analogy as long as I need. If a starving individual came to me and asked me for food and I gave that person a moldy hot dog. Whether or not I knew it was moldy is completely aside from the point. But if I gave that individual a moldy hot dog, cause I'm like, okay, well here's food because you want food. Did I do the right thing? Did I do the right thing by giving somebody something that on paper, sure, maybe that'll get them down the street, but I gave them something that can also make them ill at the same time? Complacency towards hate is mold because all that happens is that it allows to fester. It allows to grow unless you do something to clean it. That is why there is so much hate and negative attention because there is space made for hate and negative attention and space is not taken instead for inclusion, for uplifting. And it will continue to be that way until that message gets understood. How do you defend trans participation in sports? Easily. Trans men are men, trans women are women. Non-binary athletes are just as valid as well. Uh, they can compete in the division that they declare is most appropriate for their gender identity. Simple as that. Even when it comes to like, so, well, just make a league of trans individuals. Newsflash. In 2018, there was a study in Canada, a survey, that all the respondents to the study, they, uh, over the age of 15, identified themselves as transgender, okay? Out of all of the respondents, 0.24% of those individuals identified themselves as transgender. So let's now think of that number. 0.24% of individuals all around us identify as trans. That was a surprising number to me because 
typically the, the, the numbers that have been repeated regularly over the past, especially across North America, was 0.5.6%. That said, there's also an increase in uh, individuals representing in, in the states particularly that up to, um, I believe the number was 10%, gender fluid, gender diverse, right? Whether it's transgender, non-binary, genderqueer, agender, and so on. So the number is still difficult to run with because of the fact that there's not enough study done. There are not enough surveys. There's not enough tangible information, right? To, to properly identify how many individuals are trans. And one of the biggest reasons behind that is because trans individuals are terrified of being outed. Trans individuals are terrified of not receiving the medical service required for them by, by, by a medical professional because they're trans. Transgender individuals as a general whole are terrified of admitting, even if it was an online survey, even if it was a Canadian government online survey to go ahead and put it in there, they are terrified of putting that information in there for the fear that somehow, some way, that information will get leaked and then compromise their health, they'll compromise their work, it'll compromise their family. Trans individuals are terrified to disclose their authenticity because of the world around us. So 0.24% of those individuals to me seems low, but what do I know? Let's run with the numbers though. 0.24% of individuals are trans. What that means is 12 out of every 5,000 people over the age of 15 in Canada are trans. So let's take that a step further when it comes to trans participation in sports. For kids, this is totally unscientific. I read this article way back when. For kids, athletic participation is typically three out of four people. But we're using a study that's from the age of 15 plus, so I'm not gonna include them as kids because that is certainly approaching the age of adults. At adulthood, approximately one out of every four people continue to stay athletic. So out of 12 people, out of every 5,000, we now have, do we wanna do the math? Three people out of every 5,000 are transgender and athletic. I don't even feel like breaking it down now between trans men, trans women, and non-binary athletes. But even if we wanted to go ahead and like, let's just comfortably assume an even split between like, we'll use those three groups. So out of three out of every 5,000 individuals are transgender and athletic. Let's say one, maybe two are trans women who are all are clearly um, the most contentious when it comes to trans participation in sports. So first, how do I defend that, trend, that, that, that concept? Get over yourself. If you happen to be in a league, if you happen to be in a league with a trans athlete, that is rare, it is not a problem, just appreciate the experience of uniqueness and let that individual exist. That's all it is. There is not this influx of individuals trying to steal scholarships, or in my case, to go ahead and win some stupid polyester t-shirt. Because just so anyone who might think that I'm trying to invade a league or whatever, I've earned enough hoodies and t-shirts and sweatshirts and towels in a past life. I don't need more. And if anyone thinks that a trans individual goes through everything to, to live their authentic lives, but they go through all of all of that. Do you honestly think that there's a single individual out there willing to put themselves through the loss of privilege, the hate, the threats, the violence, the abuse, the diminishment, the disparagement, the solitude, and all other forms of loss that come with being trans to go ahead and invade a sport? Get over yourselves, get over yourselves. Fundamentally, when it comes to how do I defend trans participation in sports, so I'll look at that in two other ways that no one ever seems to talk about. Number one, as a taxpayer, I'm entitled to services rendered from where my tax money goes. And therefore, if there are any facilities, organizations, or services who utilize tax funding, which in principle comes in part from me, I am entitled to having my stake in there too. And that goes to everybody who pays taxes. And then number two, when it comes to trans participation in sports, sports is so important to culture. And sports is so important to socializing, and team building, and community building, 
and developing. Sports is so important to health and wellness. And sports is so important to inclusion, to feeling like an individual belongs in a group of others. And by excluding trans athletes from the sport that they are passionate to play in, and, and to exclude them from participating in the sport, in the division that aligns with their identity, you are taking away the health, the wellness, the, the, the socializing, the developing, and so on and so on and so on. You are taking, you are actively taking those away. You are actively taking those fundamental well-being values for an individual away because you feel you are more important. Allowing a trans individual, and I'm gonna say specifically, we're gonna look at kids, for example, let trans kids play because two things. If society evolves itself to the point where it understands that trans kids know they're trans kids and are allowed to develop their lives authentically as early as possible, that means they go through a life development where their body reflects the gender identity that they identify with, which means all this fear-mongering of some idea of some fucking like six foot eight, 360 pound individual who for the record is entirely valid, but to come storming in to a woman's league of fill in the sport, that, 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 that individual may be six foot eight, 340 pounds, but they only realized in the recent past that they are trans because they understand themselves better and they are valid. That's not a you problem to, 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 to stop. They are valid. It is a you problem to include. And so similarly enough, where you have a young child who realizes that they're trans and they get the medical support so that they can grow their lives authentically, meaning their bodies develop in a way that reflects their gender identity, meaning that they reflect their lives just the same as a cis individual, which means they're not as much of a threat to you anymore when it comes to sports when they're just like you. But it starts with the cis community recognizing they have a responsibility to be inclusive, not exclusive. Sports isn't about you. Sports is about everybody. Sports is about community. Sports is about teams. Sports is about inclusion. And if you do not actively include, you are not part of the problem. You are the problem. Is it possible to speak about sex and gender without being transphobic? Yes, if you try. It's not easy, especially considering there are so many ways to speak that we're so familiar with without recognizing the mindfulness necessary to be um, less gender specific. I don't want to use the word transphobic because that sounds incredibly extreme because the short answer is yes, you can absolutely speak about sex and gender without being actively transphobic. I feel like the, the way this is phrased is how do I speak without being offensive? And one of the easiest things to do about that is to try to be as gender um, neutral as possible. Unless you're directed specifically by the individual you're speaking of, they're pronouns and how you would like to speak of them. So when it comes to stuff like sex and gender without being transphobic, here, uh, here's a really good way to put it. I really personally, I don't like the question, what's my sex assigned at birth? Because that's an acknowledgement of somebody else's mistake. Someone else made a mistake, not me. And that's been my life to have to deal with because of some doctor being like, oh, okay, well, there's a penis, they're for male, right? So. And furthering that, my birth certificate, my official birth certificate, does not have an M on it. It doesn't even have an F on it. It has an X on it. Yeah, for the record, like I've explained this before as to why, right? But for the record, I am a binary trans woman and my birth certificate says X, okay? And my passport and my driver's license. Understand that what you see it's not exactly the same as all the legal documentation you may think of. Uh, I've, I've always tried my best to just not include gender or sex in the language. For example, and I'm even, I personally, I've got a habit of saying, hey guys, and so on too, right? But say like, you can say something like, hi folks, right? Or hi everyone. Little things like that are just mindful attempts to not um, to not get people in the room that you're speaking to feeling like they're being excluded or disrespected. It's as simple as that. So the easiest thing that I can recommend, do a little homework on it. There are a ton of sites online of just like, I'm used to saying this, how can I say this instead? But otherwise, if you are using terms that are actively um, harmful and transphobic, 
that's where I recommend you stop immediately. A really good source that I can recommend you go to, I linked it way back when on Twitter, um, is it's on GLAD's website, G-L-A-A-D. Um, they've got a fantastic table of things that are commonly said um, out of poor habit or intentional harm when it comes to trans individuals and the recommended thing to say otherwise. So totally check that out um, because yes, it is entirely possible, but it requires uh, a mindful effort to do that. Why did you start HRT if you can apparently be transgender without it? Well, yes, absolutely. You can be trans without without it. There's no um, policing, well, it, <laughs> depending on where you live, right? But you can like, it, your identity is valid and if your identity your sense of self says that i feel that that what is being expected of me from society is different than how i feel in my heart in my mind that is entirely valid and some people are more than comfortable with using gender expressions such as the way they choose to dress or how they um, uh, you know, if they want to be addressed with a different name and so on without going through, um, you know, let's say medical procedures or anything along those lines, they are just as valid trans individuals as a trans individual going through HRT and, 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 uh, you know, uh, certain surgeries and so on to, um, to make themselves feel more comfortable. Going through those steps isn't about the process of what other people expect of you because the whole point point of being trans is 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 recognizing that what people expect of you is wrong so to to gatekeep who makes trans people trans is it's not right and for sure there may be some trans individuals who look at other trans individuals and feel like they're the first the first the observer, their life experience is being invalidated because they feel that they've had to go through this, that, and the other thing to feel authentic, while others feel comfortable with something that is essentially looked at as so minimal. That is not a right sort of form of gatekeeping at all. I'm sorry, right? That like, I know myself that I've gone through a large lived experience of feeling uncomfortable and I feel comfortable after going on HRT. I'm on, I'm on deck for an Orky. I'm actually next in line for an Orky. I'm not planning any other major surgery or anything like that with the, with some stuff that's happened in Manitoba lately. There's even like the, the opportunity for things like, um, like, uh, uh, facial feminization surgery or whatever that may be covered by the government like all of the but I don't care about those I don't feel those are important to me for me to feel valid but other people feel like they have to check the boxes off and all that but that's a them issue that's a them issue about what makes themselves feel comfortable that's not that's not a, um, a, a, a an overarching these are the expectations if you want to join the club so why did I start HRT so that my body can feel comfortable there are, aside from like HRT is not just this participation event right that I don't I didn't go on HRT so I can feel like I'm included with the group HRT does ta tangible things it changes the body. It stops the production of testosterone, and in, or like in my case, and it introduces right estrogen into the into the body instead, so that I can have my body feel more whole with how my head feels. I feel in sync with my body now. I feel in sync with my body from being on HRT, and it took a bit of time. Right, it wasn't an overnight thing. I was actually incredibly depressed the very first day. I'm like, okay, well, here I go. Here's hoping, right? While others are ecstatic knowing that it's a step towards their their uh, their authenticity, I've been trans before I started HRT. I've like in reflection, if I can go back in time, right, and and, and explain to four or five year old me, right, that that like what what I like what my life path is like and what 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 is happening, and you know try to like obviously bring it down to you know that type of reading level, but still like I. I I've, I've always known that, that this existed. And that was long before I started HRT. So I started HRT not to validate myself, but to finally be in tune with myself. I hope it's the best way to explain that. Um, because yeah, it's like, it's, 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 it's not a membership, right? It's not proof of authenticity. It's not a, you're, you're not, you're not a woman until you grow at least this size cup, right? Or you're not a woman until your voice matches this key. You're not a man until you have a beard. You're not a man until you've got a dick this long, 
right? Like none of those things are metrics to determine the validity of an individual. And if, if an individual, their sense of self is different than the pressures put upon them by society, they are incredibly valid to express that in any way necessary. So why did I start HRT? Because I wanted to feel comfortable and I wasn't comfortable in any other way until that happened. I hope that answers that. This was a super passionate episode, um, but as I'm sure is no surprise to anybody, it's it's a passionate week. It's going to be a really long week because I know already that it's going to be full of performativeness by individuals who think that just by showing up and waving a flag is going to be lots, and it's not. Act. Trans Awareness Week isn't just being about about recognizing trans people exist. It's not about being aware because if you if you if you unless you have lived under a rock, we have had our our existence and our presence shoved in your face at least once since 2015. And I'm just using that as an even-ish number, right? Considering the beginning of, of like when Trump started to get, uh, get popular when it comes to presidency and whatnot. There has been an absolute siege against trans individuals for years and years and years. So awareness is fine and dandy, but it's action that we need. And so everybody listening to this right now, share this message, share this episode, do something. Don't just raise awareness. Don't like, don't retweet, don't just forward things, don't just resend emails. Do something. Hear the messages that are being sent by trans individuals and act on them, please. Because you have no idea the amount of concessions that trans individuals need to do for you. You have no clue how much trans individuals need to concede their lives to make cis individuals comfortable. You have no clue the amount of concessions that we have to go through so that you don't feel out of place. So do us a solid and give us the opportunity to not have to do that for once. And by not being hateful, it's not enough. Not being hateful is an expectation of the quality of living from everybody. Living a normal, proper life in, in a face of hate is not enough. Please do more. Please do more. Let us put an end to this extreme rise of hate and violence. Understand that not doing anything is nothing special. Please use your power, your privilege, and your platform to create meaningful change.